HelloFresh takes the guesswork and the extra hassle out of planning and preparing delicious meals for dinner. America's number one meal kit, HelloFresh gives you over 40 recipes to choose from each week. And then your farm fresh pre-portioned seasonal ingredients arrive at your doorstep with simple instructions to help you feel like the master chef of your kitchen. And did you know that HelloFresh is cheaper than grocery shopping and 25% less expensive than takeout? HelloFresh has been an awesome addition to our household's dinner routine. We all get involved and cook together following the pictured step-by-step instructions. It's a fun quality time and the meals are delicious. Give it a try and see for yourself. Go to HelloFresh.com slash 50 having it all and use code 50 having it all for 50% off plus free shipping. Again, to get 50% off plus free shipping, go to HelloFresh.com slash 50 having it all and use code 50 having it all. It is Ryan here and I have a question for you. What do you do when you win? Like, are you a fist pumper? A woohooer, a hand clapper, a high fiver. I kind of like the high five, but if you want to hone in on those winning moves, check out Chumba Casino. At chumbacasino.com, choose from hundreds of social casino style games for your chance to redeem serious cash prizes. There are new game releases weekly, plus free daily bonuses. So don't wait. Start having the most fun ever at chumbacasino.com. No purchase necessary. DTW, void, were prohibited by law. See terms and conditions 18. Plus. Welcome to the Having It All podcast the show about what it takes to live an abundant, loving life. My name is Matthew Bivens, and each week I'm helping you get out of your head so that you can truly have it all. Let's do it. What's up, beautiful people? Matthew Bivens here, and welcome back to another episode of the podcast. Thrilled to have you here today, and I got a a really fun one for you. I have a returning guest to the show and the conversation that we get into uh, is very personal. So I think you're going to get a lot out of it. Uh, I want to kick things off though by talking about some magic. You know, magic is our ability to influence ourselves, other people in life in a powerful, amazing, healthy way. And I've had some big magic recently in my life around showing up for myself despite my emotions. Showing up for myself despite how I might feel in the moment. And so I want to talk about this to kick off the episode because I know it's something that all of us can relate to. I know that right now or maybe sometime today or definitely sometime this week, you're going to be presented with an opportunity to do something that you know will benefit you even though it's the last thing that you want to do. So for me, the, uh, the area where I influence myself Uh, It's with my balance chart, and my balance chart is the app that I use to just keep track of my habits and make sure that I'm making deposits into myself and and, uh, you know in my life in all these different ways. And so one of my goals is that at the end of each week, I want to complete 90% of the habits on my balance chart. And so yesterday, today's Monday, yesterday, it's the end of the the day, Um, it's like evening time, probably like 8 or 9 p.m. And my balance chart was at maybe a 70. And all of the habits that I had left were anaerobic. So they were, you know, exercise habits. They were things like uh, pull-up holds and handstand push-ups and uh, some ab exercises and inverted push-ups, all sorts of different things. And I'll tell you, it was the last thing that I wanted to do at 9 p.m. on a Sunday after a full day was to essentially get a workout in. But, you know, since this is magic, you can already guess that I showed up for myself despite those emotions, despite wanting to do anything else than, you know, exert myself, I still decided to suck it up and do it. And, you know, the reason why it wasn't a motivation thing. And, you know, I wanted to, I want to make this comment as well. Like, a lot of times, I know for myself, I felt that I don't achieve the things I want in life because I lack the motivation. Or if only I had more motivation, then I would be able to accomplish my goals. I'd be able to show up powerfully for myself. And I always attributed it to motivation. However, I don't feel that way anymore. I don't feel that motivation is that key ingredient. 
because when I look up motivation in, in the uh, in the dictionary, because that's what I was doing, I wanted to look at the word, it says one of the definitions is the general desire or willingness of someone to do something, right? And so when I think about myself last night, making those deposits, getting those points, completing my habits, it wasn't because I wanted to exercise my body. I wasn't motivated to exercise my body, right? I wasn't motivated to sweat. What I wanted to do was to maintain my integrity. I wanted to complete what I said I would complete. And in that moment, it looked like getting my points. It looked like showing up and doing it, even though it was the last thing that I wanted to do. And, you know, I've said it a few times, like, I had zero desire to do this. So it was a huge piece of magic for me to show up for myself despite my emotions. And I'm extraordinarily happy and inspired that I did because I know that that's going to carry into the rest of my day and the rest of my week. You know, being able to show up and do those things that I know are healthy, that I know are powerful, even though I absolutely don't want to do them. And for you, you know, I'm just letting you know, it's okay if you don't want to do them. And it's okay if you don't find joy along the way. Because I didn't. I know I didn't necessarily find the joy in doing my push-ups. You know, I I found the joy in completing what I said I would complete. So that was my magic, and I I love kicking off these episodes with magic. You can check out all the magic that I post in the Your Day Balance Game app, and uh, feel free to message me if you're interested in that and if you have questions. Now I want to give a little bit of listener love. I really appreciate uh, when you reach out to me, and you do it in so many different ways via email, through Instagram, and through reviews on iTunes. And so today, I just want to read a review on iTunes. And um, this one was great. And I love the handle because it was one of those those handles where I had to read it like three times before I actually understood what it, what it read, what it said. Uh, this person's handle is African Queen. And it was just the spelling of that. I'm like, A-P-H-R-I. I'm like, well, what does that say? But Regardless, uh, I, I was able to to decipher the code, um, and so I want to read. I want to read their their. Let's see, where is it? Their review right now. Here we go. I've been listening to this podcast for about five months. I started from the first one and listened to mostly all of them. That's amazing. I absolutely love this podcast. I don't have any more episodes to listen to, and I'm sad. LOL. I've learned so much, and I can relate to almost all of the shows. I feel like I know Matthew, and I appreciate his transparency. It takes guts to tell the world who you are. Because of this show, I'm doing my reps. Thanks. Wow, that's awesome. African Queen, thank you. Thank you for listening, for supporting the show, and for you know getting into action. There's so many... Uh, I know with me, there's so many things that I might read or listen to or watch that are, you know, they're encouraging, they're inspirational, uh, but I don't all, I don't always get into action. So I don't always get to take the lessons and the gifts and, and spread them and do something with them, but you are. And I really appreciate that. And I really appreciate you sharing that testimony with me on iTunes. So thank you so much. If you want to connect with me on iTunes, leave a review, that'd be, that'd be pretty sweet. Uh, it's on iTunes, also known as Apple Podcasts, and you can just go on there and leave a rating and review, and that's awesome. All right, let's get to talking about today's episode. So today I have my friend Kyla Sokol Ward back on the show. Now Kyla came on a number of months ago, and we talked about sexual energy, and it was a really great conversation. And uh, you know the the topic of sexual energy to be quite honest with you, is something that I probably would have skipped five to six years ago. Because at the time, it was a little bit up there for me, a little bit up in the clouds. You know, I didn't really connect with that idea of sexual energy. However, where I'm at today, you know, it's something that completely resonates with me. So Kyle and I had a really amazing time in that conversation. And um, I definitely recommend you give it a listen if you haven't already. The episode is called Exploring Sexual Energy, What Our Relationship with Sex Reveals About Ourselves. So go check that out. And, you know, I have Kyla back on the show. And, you know, she's a, she's a pretty awesome woman. She's a women's empowerment coach. And what she does is she really keys in 
on that relationship to self. And that plays a big part in our conversation on this episode because we are talking about insecurities in the bedroom. Insecurities in the bedroom. And this one gets so personal and I love it. My absolute favorite part of this conversation that you're about to hear is when Kyle and I literally go back and forth, rapid fire style, listing off our biggest bedroom insecurities one by one. So she shares, then I share. She shares, then I share. We just go back and forth. I mean, I think I had 16 different insecurities on my list and we just go through them and just hearing all of them and talking about all of them and really sitting down and thinking about what made me insecure and why it was so eye-opening for me and incredibly incredibly healing so that's a, enough talk enough setup um, i'm gonna drop you right in the middle of my conversation with kyla and i really hope you enjoy today's conversation we're talking about insecurities in the bedroom and i think that everybody can relate to that one. <laughs> yes, I think they can. Yeah, so, you know, this was actually something that you pitched, and I'm curious, um, yeah, why did you want to talk about it? Yeah, um, I was actually, I was sort of pitching this idea, or pitching the idea in general to some of my peers and asking if you were to have, or to listen to a conversation around sex, what would you want to listen to? And... And this is something that I did intentionally for this conversation, but also in general, just something that's been on my mind of like, what are people in general thinking about sex? And again, I might have mentioned this on the last episode. It's just such a weird thing to me to think about that, like, sex is something that we're all doing. You know, let's say 90% of the world is doing of those of us who are sexually active in general. And no one's talking about it. And it's this weird secretive thing that people act like they're not doing or like we're not supposed to talk about it and of course I think we're all aware that there is this taboo sense around it but um it's it's just weird that we aren't able to talk about our experiences in detail even though everyone's doing it and so of course these insecurities are such a huge thing because no one is speaking them out loud no one's talking about their sexual experience in general and then the insecurities is like magnified a hundred a hundred times so I think um, as I was sort of putting this idea out there to my peers, a lot of what I was hearing was, well, here's something I'm interested in, but I don't know if that's normal. And maybe everyone, no one else is thinking about that. And I, there was just so much um, lack of assurance in themselves of whether or not what they were talking about was normal or what they liked or what they didn't like was normal. And I thought, wow, okay, insecurities, that sounds like the idea. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, when when I was sort of putting some thoughts on paper for this conversation, I made a big old list. And we're going to actually share uh, some of the insecurities that we've had over the years. And <laughs> Kyla, my list was so long. My list was, was, was crazy long. And I'm thinking, man, like, there's so many, so many stories I had running, so many beliefs about myself, so many fears, so many apprehensions. Mm that had to do with sex, that had to do with my body, that had to do with how I showed up, how mm -hmm. I quote unquote performed. And it was, you know, I'd never sat down and just listed those things out before. So it was pretty eye opening. And um, it, 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 I also got a glimpse as to where they, where they came from and where they originated. And that was very interesting mm. as well, because, you know, a lot of the, they didn't come from me, I picked them up from other people in other places. So um, I'm happy that we're talking about this. Um, because it's on people's minds, just like you were saying. Mm -hmm. Yes, it totally, totally is. And I think a lot of people will resonate with all of the insecurities. Yeah. Yeah. So so maybe you can share a little bit about um, when you started to become aware of some of those insecurities and some of those feelings that you had that were causing you to second guess yourself or withhold mm -hmm. or judge. Um, like, you know, did that start immediately when you were young, when you started to have feelings towards other people? Or was it something that grew over time? Um, you know, maybe we have different or similar experiences there. Yeah, I think I have a pretty lucky experience in general. I'm not actually not even sure what to attribute this to. I didn't really feel insecure sexually when I first started having sex, which was maybe when I was 18 or so. And I... 
I mean, I definitely didn't know what I was doing at all. <laughs> None of us do. But <laughs> yeah. um, I didn't really, I didn't really feel insecure about it. Um, and I think that, well, actually, now that I'm really thinking about it, I think there were a lot of insecurities that were just sort of like dug so deep. I didn't realize that they were insecurities. Um, but there's definitely an inclination to like really, really show up in a certain way. And so much of it was, of course, about like how I thought the my partner wanted me to look and to sound and to act and to perform and really trying to be that instead of being present in my own experience. And I think I started to become more aware of this. Um, maybe with my last partner, the last relationship I was in, and we were together for, um, I don't know, two, two and a half years. And that was like the most deep experience I've had sexually with the same person. And I think it just started to become aware to me that like I wasn't really showing up the way that I wanted to in sex and that I was actually very insecure about showing up how I wanted to because I was afraid it wouldn't be good enough for him. It wouldn't be pleasurable for him. And I was very, I thought, you know, I won't be able to, um, like I won't, he won't, he won't be able to be as turned on as if I'm not showing up in whatever way I think he wants. And I wasn't able to have a conversation about that with him. I never did. And, um, yeah. And I think it was probably after that relationship ended was thinking about how I'm showing up during sex and where am I really holding back and why aren't I able to ask for what I want? Um, in a lot of ways in sex and what is that, how is that translating to other parts of my life? Oof, I can relate to that totally. So I'm curious, mm. uh, two things came up for me, two questions for you. Um, how were you showing up versus how you wanted to show up? So you were doing X, but you really wanted to be doing Y. I'm curious about that. And then my second question is, where do you think your, the, the, the model for, how you thought you needed to show up, where do you think it came from? Mm. Yeah, well, so I was showing up in a way that was very, very powerful, very sexy, very um, kind of formulaic, honestly. The sex in that relationship became kind of formulaic of just like, okay, this is, this is like from first and then second and then third. And it was always really good, always really good, always really fun, very loving. Um, but there wasn't really room for creative expression. And so I, I was showing up in like, uh, in a way that was, yeah, again, very sexy and I wanted it to be more romantic. And, um, <laughs> what was challenging about that was I was afraid that if I asked for something that was more like lovemaking versus having sex, um, that he wouldn't become and that he wouldn't get turned on enough, which is like kind of insane to say out loud because we did love each other so much, but we, and sex is always sex. It wasn't about lovemaking necessarily. Oh, um, I get that. Yeah. It, and I was, yeah. Yeah. Um, and I was always just too concerned that like it wouldn't be good enough for him. And again, I was never, I was never willing to even have the conversation. So I could have been totally wrong about that. I'm sure I was, I would have been really wrong about that but I was really insecure about that desire of mine to be made love to instead of fucked essentially. Um, and there's room for both. Both of those things are great. Um, but yeah, it was really always one over the other. Um, and as far as where that came from, I think just very much like uh, what we see in movies, what we're told, Oh, this is what men are attracted to. You know, men don't want to talk about love making men want to have sex. And um it's kind of an interesting thing, like as someone who very much identifies as like a hardcore feminist and, I, you know, very much putting my needs first, especially when it comes to sex. Those were still things that I like were really deeply ingrained in me um, that I couldn't quite let go of in those situations. HelloFresh takes the guesswork and the extra hassle out of planning and preparing delicious meals for dinner. America's number one meal kit, HelloFresh gives you over 40 recipes to choose from each week. And then your farm-fresh pre-portioned seasonal ingredients arrive at your doorstep with simple instructions to help you feel like the master chef of your kitchen. And did you know that HelloFresh is cheaper than grocery shopping? 
and 25% less expensive than takeout, HelloFresh has been an awesome addition to our household's dinner routine. We all get involved and cook together, following the pictured step-by-step instructions. It's a fun quality time, and the meals are delicious. Give it a try and see for yourself. Go to HelloFresh.com slash 50HavingItAll and use code 50HavingItAll for 50% off plus free shipping. Again, to get 50% off plus free shipping, go to HelloFresh.com slash 50HavingItAll and use code 50HavingItAll. With lucky landslots, you can get lucky just about anywhere. Dearly beloved, we are gathered here today to... Has anyone seen the bride and groom? Sorry, sorry, we're here. We were getting lucky in the limo and we lost track of time. No, Lucky Land Casino, with cash prizes that add up quicker than a guest registry. In that case, I pronounce you lucky. Play for free at LuckyLandSlots.com. Daily bonuses are waiting. No purchase necessary. Void were prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details. I get it. I mean, like, mm. there's so many things that just, I don't know, they start when we're young, <laughs> you know? Like, I think back to, to my totally. early... Like with some of my first insecurities were in middle school when people, my classmates were, uh, you know, they were boyfriends and girlfriends. They were, they were dating one another. Mm -hmm. And I was hearing stories about, about like, I don't think it was sex back then, but it was definitely oral going on. And Mm -hmm. I remember a guy on my bus, he had pictures. We're like in middle school, right? 13, 14, 15. He had pictures of him like with, girls over spring break he had just gone back from spring break down in you know like florida or something and he had these pictures Mm -hmm. and this stuff was not even on my mind like it it, yeah you know but here here's this guy who you know he's the same age as me he had physically matured way sooner than me you know he was much bigger than me had starting to have hair in his face and i guess those hormones were moving but here i am thinking that i needed to like there was something wrong with me that I wasn't showing up like he was and do, and doing the things he was. And so it was like very early on mm-hmm. that comparison myself to my peers. And I think that just for me went, you know, that it started in my, in my 12, 13, 14 and just sort of continued up through my teens and into my twenties. Um, but going back to what you said, you know, the talking about having sex versus being made love to, I know from mm-hmm. from a male's perspective, from my perspective, you know, I got so much of my sex education from porn. And yeah. the stuff I was watching, I was none of it was making love. And yeah. you know, when I when I heard you say romance, like, you know, you wanted it to be more more romantic, um what 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 thought came in my head was intimacy. You know, like mm-hmm. that intimacy. And that was not what was modeled for me. That was not what I was watching. That's not <laughs> what it was being programmed for me. So like hearing you say it from the female perspective, I'm like, wow, I was the guy who was just, you know, jackhammering the partners I had mm-hmm. because that's what I saw. And like, that's the stuff that I modeled. And, you know, and, and of course there's like, uh, you know, when people like open up their wallet and they, they flick it out and there's like a hundred photos of their kids and one of those little accordion things. Like that, yeah. that was what I would bring to the bedroom in terms of like insecurities. And it was, <laughs> here we go, broop, and here they're all going to come out. And so I would just go back to those things that were modeled to me, the, the way that I thought you were supposed to do it, looking at porn and, and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. And man, yeah, so that you, you, you uh, stirred a few things in me with your sharing. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting that you bring up like having it start even before you even were thinking about sex. And yeah. Uh, yeah, I hadn't even really like considered that. And I very much was in the same boat of like, I matured physically much slower than most of my peers, like much, much slower. I was very much a late bloomer in all aspects and, and sexually as well. Like even people like making out, I was like, are we doing this now? Like I had no idea. And like, I didn't get my first kiss until I was 16 years old. And like everyone I knew was having sex by then. And um, it's just, it just blew my mind of like, yeah. And I, I felt really, really insecure about that in high school of like not even having kissed someone and was really like embarrassed about that. Um, and just, yeah, like hear, hearing what other people are doing and especially that age, it's like you also don't get the idea that 
no one knows what they're doing. It doesn't mean it's good. It doesn't mean it's fun. It doesn't mean they even want to do it, but everyone's just doing it because it's the thing. And yeah. um, again, it's like, if we're not talking about it, we don't know. Now, did you have anybody that you could ask questions to or talk to about it? Um, the, the invitation was probably open from my mother, but it would not have been a fun time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, um, I think like my, maybe like my older sister, I could have talked to her, but I, I was so embarrassed about it. I just didn't want to. Were you seeing like, you know, did you, was your older sister going on dates and making out with boys and having boyfriends and things when you were in this, in this period where like none of that stuff was even on your, on your mind? She definitely was. Yeah. Like I remember boys really liked my older sister when we were in high school and stuff. And like people always knew that, that we were sisters and I was really afraid of having sort of like the reputation of being like her innocent little sister. And like, I was like the cutesy innocent little sister. And like, I didn't want to be that, but I also didn't want to go and do the things that would make me not innocent in their eyes. Um, and yeah, it just felt really, uh, like insecure with male attention and and all of it. Like I wanted it, but I was also afraid of it. And I think that a lot of, a lot of young girls can relate to that. Yeah. And I guess what I'm, what I'm taking away is like so much of the insecurities that I've carried around with me today, you know, I'm, I'm 31, right? That stuff goes back to 12 years old and mm-hmm. riding on the bus and hearing conversations and, you know, having a, a girl make a move on me and me not knowing what, the hell to do how to respond Mm -hmm. and you know like it goes back so far and you know on the the one hand i'm I'm appreciative of being able to think back and remember those things um, because now it's like okay i i I see where they originated from so you know that's kind of like you know i i I can go through and see the the origin point so now i can do something about it and then on the other hand Mm -hmm. i'm like god that's so fucked up that 12 year old me was like dealing with that shit like I don't know. I didn't know anything about anything in that area yet. It just sort of thrown into it. So I, for me, as a, I'm a father, right? You know, and and mm-hmm. um, I think, okay, is there anything like what? Who do I need to be to create a space of safety for conversations to happen? And you know, mm-hmm. and, and same with with my wife. Like, who do we need to be as parents, as as um, as a, a couple, as a part, as partners? in order to create an environment where our daughter can ask questions or, you know, mm-hmm. we don't make those same topics taboo that were made taboo yeah. in my house. I had the two minute, you know, birds and bees conversation with my dad. That was extremely <laughs> awkward. I didn't get the sense that he wanted to be there. I felt awkward mm-hmm. about it. And I was just like, oh, I know everything. I'm cool. I don't need this talk, dad. And that was it. Mm-hmm. We never talked about sex in my house. We never talked about yeah. dating. We never talked about like, it wasn't until maybe my late teens when my dad was like, hey, listen, two things. Don't get arrested and don't get a girl pregnant. And <laughs> like, it just wasn't talked about. And so, you know, I'm, I'm, my intention is to create a different culture in my household, a different atmosphere around it. And um, mm-hmm. yeah, it's just, that, that all to me is very interesting looking back. Yeah, yeah, I think that's so beautiful. It's just yeah, like you said, creating a different culture and very much being aware that like it's it's uncomfortable to talk about these things, and that's okay. And we don't. It's like they are insecurities, and insecurities don't always feel awesome to talk about. And sometimes we don't know what everyone is thinking. We can't know what everyone is thinking, and that's okay. And to have that sort of be the um, the standard that like, this might be a little uncomfortable and like, it's okay for it to be uncomfortable. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't talk about it. Uh, I'm so happy you said that because, you know, sex can absolutely be an awkward topic. And, Mm -hmm. you know, I, have been, I've been nervous for both of our recorded conversations because they're about (laughs) sex and you know what I mean? It's, it, it, like, like you're right. It doesn't have to be a hundred percent comfortable. Like it doesn't have to be, you know, uh, hey, the plumber's coming today. Hey, you know, mm-hmm. I'm doing this today. Hey, let's talk about sex now. Hey, it doesn't necessarily need to be that, but being open to having those conversations, I think, is the important part. Yes. Yeah. I think there's a lot of pressure, like when sexual energy and when this topic gets thrown around, of like, oh, you have to, 
just be totally open to it and, and free love and you have to be so comfortable with yourself that you can talk about all of the intimacies with this. It's like, you don't have to be totally comfortable with it. Like, it's a little awkward. That's okay. Yeah. Yeah, and that, that's that's like a great, like, it's. I think it's important we say that again. Like, it's okay for it to be totally awkward. Because I know for me, when something was awkward and uncomfortable, I would not do it. I would just go the opposite direction because I don't yeah. want it. You know, I don't want to face that. It feels awkward. It feels uncomfortable. And in my mind, it, that wasn't okay. So right. it's like, I want right. to do everything possible to avoid discomfort. I want to do everything possible to avoid anxiety, to avoid fear. And therefore, let me go in the other direction. And so that meant in relationships, when I started to become sexually active at 17, and when I, when I started to you know really develop relationships in my 20s, it meant that we never talked about this stuff. Never talked mm-hmm. about our feelings, what we wanted to experience, insecurities. And I would do exactly what I had taught myself to do, and that was go the other way. And that always inevitably ended up coming back in some sort of form that was unhealthy and, and destru- you know, destructive to the relationship. Mm, yeah. Yeah. And I think what you're saying about is like striking something with me because I was recently at, um, I know we had talked about orgasmic meditation on our last, last yeah. conversation. I was at an orgasmic meditation, like uh, immersion weekend uh, about a month ago in Los Angeles. And there were maybe 150 people there. And what was, so I, I had a lot of takeaways from that weekend. My biggest one was the men in that room. It was like maybe 50, 50 male, female, the men in that room sharing their insecurities about sex and about intimacy and relationships and love. And hearing that from men is something that is really not talked about enough. And I think it's, um, there's very much a, Space, not enough of a space, but still a space for women to talk about their insecurities, or maybe it's even expected that women feel insecure in the bedroom. But I think, you know, men, it's like there's the whole macho thing happening, and that, like, yeah, men know what they're doing, and men can always get off during sex. And um, of course, it's easier for them. And I was so floored hearing all of these men make these vulnerable shares about, like, how terrified they are during sex and all of these insecurities that they have. And it really, it was so touching to have all these men be that vulnerable and then also very eye-opening of like, holy shit, we are all afraid of this. Like, we all have this going on. This is not exclusive to, to one gender. Wow. That sounds like a pretty uh, pretty powerful experience being in a room with a, a lot of folks who are sharing like that. That's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, it was really powerful. So let's, this is a great segue. Let's move into the next part of the conversation. The one that is what got me feeling a little nervous because you and I, <laughs> we, we thought of and, 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 you know, wrote down our insecurities, the things that we had been feeling, uh, insecure about ourselves, fears, things like that when it comes to sex and, and, uh, it, you know, being intimate in the bedroom. So I think it would be great if we talked about them and, um, we can kind of go back and forth. I can share an insecurity. You can share an insecurity and we can go through them and then circle back on a few and, and dive into them a little deeper. What do you think? Let's do it. I'm scared. I'm excited. (laughs) (laughs) Cool. So I, I, I was sharing with you, um, before we officially started that when I was doing this, I had a huge list. I had a big list of insecurities (laughs) and that was very eye opening. I, I really didn't, didn't realize that. So I'll start. One of the top insecurities for me is finishing too quickly, being so mm-hmm. caught up in needing to last long, needing to last longer than my partner. And if mm-hmm. I come before her, then I have failed. And mm. being in that headspace that comes with that feeling of, am I going to finish too quickly? Holy crap, I feel mm-hmm. the tingle. I feel the sensation. Oh my gosh. And then, you know, a lot of times that anxiety makes it even harder for me to have that body control. So number one for me is finishing too quickly. What's yours? Yeah, on that note, one of the ones that I thought of was that um, I take too long to come and always being afraid of like, is he bored? And is he like, yeah, is he bored? Does his hand hurt? Does his mouth hurt? Does his body hurt? Whatever's happening of like, is this... um yeah, of, of like all of it being so focused on him and 
and what he's experiencing and not just like being in the state of pleasure. That is the purpose of, of having sex. Mm. I can hear that. I get it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> All right, cool. So uh, my next one is not being able to make my partner orgasm multiple times. Being Ugh. insecure if if I, and, th- and this is all in quotes, because I, I recognize how incorrect mm-hmm. the statement is. M- you know, if I am unable to make her come two, three, four, five times, then I am not a powerful lover. I'm not a, mm-hmm. a, a real man. Um, if I don't make her have one of those experiences where, you know, she's in like a sex coma afterwards. And you know, <laughs> that, yeah, and and... The, the the part for me that I recognize as very damaging, unhealthy, is the idea that it's my responsibility to make her yeah. have a, a you know her multiple orgasms or a pleasurable experience. So the insecurity mm-hmm. around that. Yeah, oh, yeah. Thank you for saying that. Um, one of mine. Let me see here. That I I'm afraid that I'm too loud or that like the noises that I make are too weird or that like if I become too uninhibited then it will get too weird <laughs> um yeah I'll make some noises that will turn him off in some way uh I- I'll piggyback on that one because one of the ones <laughs> that I have is that um my orgasm noises are too weird like they're <laughs> yeah like they're the grunts or the you know sometimes like I get real I know it's real deep real deep noises that come yeah. out and those are weird and they're awkward or my sex talk is is bizarre or turns her off or whatever so essentially this idea that any vocalization any communication communicating that i'm enjoying the experience is having the effect of turning her off or making her not want to be with me yes 100 percent. that's one of mine as well i'm very i'm very very into dirty talk and I'm, especially like if it's with a new partner and if I start saying things, I think it, it comes for me, it like comes out very naturally. And then I have this moment, like right after I say something, I'm like, oh my God, what if he's not into this? Yeah. And then if he's not, it's like, that's going to be a problem for me because that's so much, like that's so much of how I get turned on. And I think women in general, like we're, you know, we're verbal. We love, we love hearing things from men. Um, and yeah, so like being afraid that he's going to think it's weird. Or like, where is this coming from? And um, yeah, that is, sounds crazy. And then also be afraid that he just won't like it and the sex will be bad. Yep. Man, okay. So uh, <laughs> next for me is being insecure about what turns me on. So the things that I want to try, mm-hmm. like anal, you know, and being scared mm-hmm. to say that, like, like being, oh my gosh, I'm going to be judged because I want to try that. Or you know, yeah. sharing some of the things that I've experienced with my wife and things that maybe she hasn't experienced and then being insecure about how she's going to view me now that she knows that I've done this thing. So that mm-hmm. that definitely has been an insecurity of mine. Yeah, yeah. Oh my gosh, that's a big one. Um, one of mine is, <laughs> this is a big one that's been on my mind a lot recently that I've been trying to talk about more with, with women in my life is the appearance of my pussy and um, very much like I have the I have the cognitive knowledge that like all pussies look different each one's like a snowflake everyone is unique and also having the fear of like but what if mine is like the most unique one ever and <laughs> being again cognit- cogn- cognitive awareness that that's probably not the case and um, there are lots of whatever. There's lots of different appearances and forms that pussies can come in. But yeah, having a lot of insecurity of like, what if mine is so weird? And um, I brought this up to to a woman recently. And she said, "Have you seen a lot of other pussies?" And I was like, "No, honestly, I haven't." And she's like, "I think, you know, I I don't have suggestions for how you can do this, but like that would be really helpful for you to." see what other countries look like because what you've seen in porn like those are like those women are chosen for a specific reason like you don't see every kind of body type in porn and um yeah so that's that's a big one for me is the appearance of it oh i get it i get it and (laughs) we'll take a little tangent because in oming isn't one of the um one of the steps in oming to Mm -hmm. describe yeah, so like for the partner who's who's doing the oming, to doing the stroking, 
um, to describe, you know, that, that area, the, 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 uh, to describe the other person. And I think that is one of the coolest parts of oming, in my opinion, where you're actually getting up close and you're describing, you know, the lips and the clitoris and you're describing the colors mm-hmm. and all of that. Because who, who does that? Who does that? Right. You know? And, and, I have experienced, you know, I actually owned earlier today and, um, wow. Yeah. Uh, uh, I don't know how many hours ago, but, um, and that was just, I've experienced so much healing in, uh, the person I was oming with from just that part alone. It's just mm-hmm. that part. I mean, the rest of the experience is powerful and healing as well, but just that part alone where somebody is, you know, looking at you and, and describing and, you know, the contours mm-hmm. and the shapes that, I mean, that is mind blowing. I think what, what, what can come from that. So I'm happy that you shared that insecurity. Yeah. Yeah. That was, that definitely like with, with orgasmic meditation is 100% the most uncomfortable part for me. And I didn't realize how profoundly uncomfortable it was for someone to just like look at my pussy. And it's like, yeah. it's not a sexual experience it's not like having to do with sex and just looking at it and making observations and I'm so uncomfortable with it and um yeah it is like it is so healing and such a good practice um in just being present and um uh what was again oh every time that I own and that step happens the noticing step every time I am surprised at what the guy is saying I'm like like he's saying things that I have not seen in my own pussy and that like because again no one's ever just sat there and told me about it (laughs) um and yeah so every time I'm like really is that that?" like I have to like look with him and (laughs) and like see um yeah there's all these like physical things happening that I just don't pay attention to because I think women are so taught to be like disgusted by their own bodies and um yeah, and it's just it's not something that you look at in detail and it should be because it is such a beautiful body part. It's so incredible. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. All right. So for me, another <sighs> one of my insecurities, um, this one was more, I would say, probably in my twenties. Uh, being insecure about poor performance because I've either mm-hmm. haven't had sex in a long time or I haven't had very many partners. So, mm-hmm. you know, I I definitely went after my first girlfriend, you know, the where I lost my virginity. I went a year, a couple years without having mm-hmm. another partner and then another girlfriend there and then a few more years. So, I had a 4-year relationship coming out of college and before her, it had been a couple of years. So, I stepped into mm-hmm. that terrified because the only thing I'd been doing is masturbating like crazy in that time. <laughs> and you know, I sort of like trying to train myself so that when I got a real person in front of me, I was able to, to last. Go back to that first insecurity I shared of finishing too quickly. So I had all of this anxiety around performance and it was so linked to my experience. And then, you know, as, as, my, as my, my sexual uh, history and things went on, just the number of people, I thought, oh my gosh, I've only slept with three people. I've only slept with four people, mm-hmm. whatever it was. And and that messed with my head as well, because I thought, well, maybe they just didn't tell me how lame I was. Or maybe they, mm. you know, whatever it was, maybe they, m- maybe they were just trying to be kind. Or maybe that's why we ended up breaking up because uh, I, I couldn't satisfy them because, you know, they were bored or whatever it was. And so those poor performance, the insecurities, um, stemming from not having sex in a, for a long time or not having very many partners is definitely something that I've, I've struggled with. Mm, yes, 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 yes. So real. And again, I think something that like, we don't hear men saying enough, like we assume that like men are having sex all the time and that's not the case for a lot of people. It was um, like my, yeah, my beautiful. friend group. I'm not, I, I, I don't mean to call out my buddies, but like my buddies <laughs> and I in college, like we were not having sex all the time. You know, we, mm-hmm. we would have a girlfriend and, and, you know, we would have one girlfriend who, who we would be with for a year, a couple of years or whatever, but we were not the crew that I thought the other guys in my school were, were, were like, you know, sleeping with different people every weekend and having, having flings and one night stands and, and all of that. Uh, that certainly wasn't me. And that wasn't the handful of guys that, um, 
that I was really tight with in college at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So glad that got said. Um, yeah, kind of piggybacking off of that. I think like the number of people that I've slept with, I feel insecure about, and it's not even that I, I have an idea that it's too high, but that number is too, I slept with maybe, I want to say seven. Um, I won't like go through them all right now. Seven, eight people maybe, but I, I had, (laughs) I had a sexual experience recently, like in the last few months. And it was, basically over as soon as it started just like she just came very quickly and um yeah again you know no judgment it happens it's fine um but in my head I remember like that was the only time I fought with him and I thought to myself like oh that didn't count that like that's not gonna add to my number and and I even hate that phrase of like what is your number Mm -hmm. because it's so absurd and so arbitrary and um it's just really not something that you keep track of. It means nothing. Um, but I did have that thought cross my mind and I was like, what the hell is that? Like, why do I care whether or not this person counts for something that shouldn't and doesn't mean anything? Um, so yeah, that was really, uh, it's, it's, yeah, again, it's a weird thing that I don't realize is on my mind until it just shows up out of nowhere. No, I get it. I get that. I've heard something very similar from my wife where, you know, the more people, that over the years, you know, the more partners that she had, feeling like her, she was less pure, or that less valuable, mm-hmm. or the stock is going yeah. down, or whatever. And um, it's funny, because I think with guys, at least in guy circles, it's the opposite. It's how right. many women have you slept with? Oh, wow, the more women you've slept with, that's, you know, that, the, the, that's, that just shows your prowess, that shows how masculine you are, that shows how attractive you are that show all of that stuff. And um, uh, yeah, it's fascinating, fascinating. So um, for me, one of mine was, and this I totally got from porn, uh, insecure because I had, I was never able to make a woman squirt. And that to me in my mind was the pinnacle of, of sexual pleasure. When the person I'm with can't control their orgasm to the point where it's just like a geyser, because that's mm. that's what you see in the videos, and that's what I was watching. Oh my gosh! Yeah. Wow, and- I've never. That's that's new to me. I love that you said that. Oh my gosh, I'm so curious about. I've never like asked men about that. I'm really curious if like other men kind of have also picked that up from porn of that being just sort of like the holy grail. Yeah, that uh, that's what it was to me wow. I, because I had never experienced it, and I assumed since I never experienced it, it meant that mm-hmm. I had never gotten my partner to that level. And even to the point where one of my girlfriends, I asked her multiple times, "Did you just squirt? Was that? Did you squirt?" Yeah. Me, you know, and and she's like, "No, what are you talking about?" And uh, because I wanted, I wanted that validation. I wanted that, like, yes, right. I did it. Oh my gosh. I'm a man mm-hmm. because I was able to to make her squirt. So that was one of mine. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Amazing. Um, what is mine? <laughs> this one's kind of funny. I have a very, very small mouth. And I am always really concerned if I'm like performing oral sex that like it's that it's not good for him or that like I'm always I'm always have this fear of like, can you feel my teeth? Like or whatever. Um and I remember my, yeah, my last partner used to always like comment on it, but in a cutesy way, like he like loved it and thought it was great, but I'm always, I'm so insecure about it. And, um, yeah, there's just a lot of, it's, I mean, it's hard. It's like, I love giving head. I do. Um, but I, yeah, I'm always really concerned that like, you know, it freaking hurts my mouth after a while. And like, I'm always concerned going into it. of like, what if this is going to take, longer than my physical body can handle and then I'm gonna have to quit and like I'm gonna feel really bad about it if like I can't make him come um or if I can't go at it long enough to make him come yeah there's a lot of insecurities that go into that one well well this is one that I didn't even write down but um the same for me but going down on on a woman Mm -hmm. so the same things around like am I going to be able to stick with this long enough for her to get there and yeah, you know, because I've been with some women where and, and, and some instances where it's 20 minutes, 20 plus minutes. And mm-hmm. I'm, I'm like, oh, my gosh, my jaw is exhausted. My neck is exhausted. Yeah. My body hurts from being in this 
laying down position with my <laughs> my chin tilted forward. So I've absolutely thought that. And then it's even gotten to the point where I've avoided initiating oral on her because I'm like, totally. uh, I don't I don't really I don't want to have to try to face the gauntlet of a 30 minutes of going down on you and just for you not to have an orgasm so that I feel like I couldn't I couldn't do it. So I just totally. wouldn't initiate it and would just try to avoid it. So I, I can feel you on that insecurity. I share it. Yes, yes, yes. Um, mm, what's another one? I am, <laughs> I think I get concerned of like, if, and I think a lot of women are like this. Like I think men very much sexually, and correct me if I'm wrong, like men, it's like once you're started, like you're going and you're good to go. But women, I feel like can be a real roller coaster ride and like, I can be turned on as hell one second and just like really turned off the next. And that can happen really quickly. And um, if that happens, I get really uh, insecure about how of either should I just like fake it till I make it type of thing, not fake an orgasm, but just like try to get myself turned on again um, or tell him that I want to stop doing whatever even if we're just like making out or whatever like tell him that I don't want to go any further and then I feel insecure about that of like we've already sort of gotten into this and how do I tell him I just like don't I'm just like not in the mood anymore I was five seconds ago and now I'm not and it's like it really is that simple it's usually like nothing that he did it's just like I don't know it just went away and um yeah there's a lot of insecurity there too oh I think it's great that you shared that because it sort of gives people permission to be honest with how they're feeling in the moment and share mm-hmm. if they're no longer into it. Because I, I totally, I totally think, and I, like once you initiate, it's almost like, okay, you have to finish. Like somebody right. has to come because it's, it started where you can absolutely, you know, for, for a woman and a man say, Hey, you know what? I'm no longer feeling this. And like, yeah, I, I don't know. It just, I don't feel like I've given ever given someone permission to do that. Maybe in my energy or, or maybe in like mm. beforehand saying, "Hey, if you're not feeling it, and you know, just tell me." Um, and at the same time, I don't know if I've ever been given permission or felt like I could because it mm-hmm. hasn't happened a ton with me. But there's absolutely been moments where I was turned on, and now I'm no longer am, and I feel like it might take a lot of mental energy to get me back turned on again. So I'm sort mm-hmm. of hoping that it could just be over quicker, or or you know, whatever, and. um yeah, so that, I'm, I'm happy you shared that. Hello, it is Ryan, and I was on a flight the other day playing one of my favorite social spin slot games on ChumbaCasino.com. I looked over at the person sitting next to me, and you know what they were doing? They were also playing Chumba Casino. Coincidence? I think not. Everybody's loving having fun with it. Chumba Casino is home to hundreds of casino-style games that you can play for free anytime, anywhere, even at 30,000 feet. So sign up now at ChumbaCasino.com to claim your free welcome bonus. That's ChumbaCasino.com and live the Chumba life. No purchase necessary. VGW. Void or prohibited by law. See terms and conditions 18 plus. Hello, it is Ryan, and we could all use an extra bright spot in our day, couldn't we? Just to make up for things like sitting in traffic, doing the dishes, counting your steps, you know, all the mundane stuff. That is why I'm such a big fan of Chumba Casino. Chumba Casino has all your favorite social casino style games that you can play for free anytime anywhere with daily bonuses that should brighten your day a little actually a lot so sign up now at chumbacasino.com that's chumbacasino.com no purchase necessary btw void were prohibited by law see terms and conditions 18 plus yeah yeah and i think that sort of goes like back to what you were saying about like giving head like going down on a woman it's like if you're just not into like if you're in physical pain like yeah you have permission to stop even though it's yes it's again it's one of those things like it's awkward to have that conversation and to say that, but like, it's important and we need to be able to, to be that, uh, be that honest with one another. If we're going to be stripping down and doing these things together. Absolutely. Absolutely. Like we, and we're taking another tangent right now, I I, I realize, but (laughs) it's like we, we are okay stripping down in to a certain level, right? Like I, I am for the most part, I know, and some of my insecurities have to do with my body and being too skinny and, you know, not having the, the, the type of action figure body that I think women want mm. and turn them on, right? And so to an extent, I'm okay, or I have been. It, my, a lot of the insecurities I'm sharing are things that I have felt in the past 
Some of them I still mm-hmm. relate with today, but a lot of these are, are ones that, you know, they came up in the past. So, you know, in the past, it's like, okay, I'm cool stripping down to a certain level, but going to a deeper level, a deeper level of honesty and then honest communication mm-hmm. is like, no, 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 I don't want to go there. And so just like you said, we might be, you know, servicing our partner and then feel like we want to stop. But then, no, no, I don't feel like I have permission to stop because I started this and therefore I have to finish this or I'm no longer turned on, but I don't ha- I don't think I can say anything because we've already initiated it and they're going to be upset. It's like we're okay getting to a certain level of vulnerability, but going deeper, mm, no, I'm just going to suck it up and ride this out. And, you know, maybe we'll talk about it later, but probably not. Yeah, yeah. Like we are not obligated to do anything sexually, but we very much feel it. Yeah, yeah. All right, so another one of my insecurities is not being commanding enough. And what I mean by that is, Ooh. you know, not being that man who uh, would pick her up and flip her on her back and turn mm-hmm. her into positions and take her against the wall and do this. And, you know, because in my mind, that was that's what you do when you're a man, right? Like you you mm-hmm. you have that sort of athleticism and that sort of prowess to be able to do those things. And so in moments when I didn't feel like I could, those were insecurities that came up for sure. I love that you use the word athleticism because that's so much of what it is. It's like, it's not even so much of it is not even about like the desire to, to be that commanding, to do those things. It's like you're moving the body of another human. You have like a hundred plus pounds to work <laughs> yeah. with. And it's, yeah. It's like, yeah, you can't just like flip people over just because you're turned on. Like it's, <laughs> it's crazy. Um, but that's what yeah, I saw. Kind of that, that's what I saw yeah, in right. porn. Like I think, you listening right now, you get that so much of my stories and insecurities and just the stuff around sex for me came from porn. So that's like, Mm -hmm. that's what I saw on camera. And I'm like, oh, I guess that's what you're supposed to be able to do. I'm like, wow, well, Mm -hmm. I I can't pick her up with one arm and flip her over and do so darn. All right. Well, I must not be able to completely please her, assuming that that's how Mm -hmm. my partner wanted to be pleased and treated. Right. Yeah, totally. Not everyone does. If yeah. we're not talking about it, we don't know. Totally, totally. <laughs> mm, yes. Yeah, that reminds me of one of mine, which is that, like, I'm not flexible enough. I'm not flexible in the right ways. And I actually, I actually, like, am pretty flexible. I do a lot of yoga. But I, yeah, there, there's definitely been times when, like, I've been in certain positions and my partner, like, really wants my legs in some way that just doesn't freaking feel good. And I'm just so distracted by the fact that like I'm in pain or that like I'm doing a hamstring stretch and I'm not enjoying what's happening sexually. And um, yeah, having just, and, and in those instances, I, I have stopped and been like, can we, can we change this up? So it's, it's like, again, it's one of those things like it's awkward to be like, this doesn't feel good. And like, I know you're loving this and you're like fulfilling some kind of fantasy of whatever kind of position you want to see me in. But like, it's actually it actually really hurts and I don't want to do this. Um, yeah, but like being afraid of like disappointing them of like, oh, but I know they want my legs to be like behind my fucking ears, even though no one can do that comfortably. But yeah. Oh, you you, you totally <laughs> just uh, inspired a new one for me. It wasn't originally on my list, <laughs> but, but insecure in saying what doesn't feel good. So, if, yeah. you know, someone's going down on me and they're like pulling on my balls and I don't like that. <laughs> Sometimes, you know, in the past, I just would just like breathe through it. I'd be like, okay, I can, I can do this and she'll stop soon. Or, you know, Mm -hmm. if, if like fingernails on my back or something and, you know, I may not want fingernails Mm. on my back, but feeling insecure to actually say it because the fear is that by me saying something I don't like, it's going to either kill the momentum, it's going to create some sort of awkward moment, some sort of awkward pause, or it's going to upset her. And all three of those things yeah. are going to mean that the session is done. And so mm. instead of ending the session, I will just, you know, suck it up and, you know, tap into some, some, some other place to be able to get through what is not feeling so great. Yes. Yeah. And I think it's so important that men and women, especially like together having these conversations in non-sexual context, because it's like, we don't, we don't know what feels good and what doesn't if we don't if we are not owners of those body parts 
and like it's there's so much going on there like there's so many sensations there's so many like different parts of the body that like feel good for certain people and not for others and whatever and like you know sexual body parts are not um and it's just like it really requires so much conversation and we put so much pressure on ourselves to just know what men want and know what women want and it's like there's so much happening there and we don't know about it because we've never had that body part if you're in a heterosexual relationship and like there's just so much there for us to learn and totally. we're just expected to just know and go into it and be good at it. Yeah. Yeah. Man. Mm. Do you have any yeah. more? Um, oh yeah, I do. Let me see here. Um, very, a lot of insecurity around, uh, I was just talking about this recently with someone around like the smell of my pussy. And um, this is one thing that I think like I was insecure about, I think, like, you know, when I was younger and now I think there's, there's definitely a bit of anger around it as well because I think both men and women are very much raised like, oh, your pussy just smell like freesias or mangoes or something. And it's like, you know what? <laughs> yeah. That's not what pussy smell like. They just don't. And it's, it isn't always about hygiene. It's like your pussy smells like a pussy. And that's what it is. And I think so many women, like, struggle with this of like, oh, being clean and blah, blah, blah. I'm like, yes, personal hygiene is definitely a thing and, and not not going to put that away. But it's, um, yeah, there's still a lot of insecurity around it. Of like, what if he doesn't like it? What if it turns him off? Oof. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, yeah. All right, so, 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 so here's two that collapse into one. Um, not being able to keep, to keep up with her. So I think it has mm. it has to do with the, you know the experience thing and the quote unquote performance and the reason I put performance in quotes is that like when you think about a performance you know like your favorite musical artist performing you know they're on stage and the spotlight's on them and it's like the pressure is on them and for mm-hmm. me that's how I was that was my context for sex like the spotlight was on me and the pressure was on me so that's why when I say performance yeah. I do quotes but. Um, yeah, not being able to keep up with her. So if I have a partner who, you know, is just has a, a voracious sexual appetite who can just take a, a, a like, a, like mm. a, a tempo that I can't keep up with or, you know, they want it harder than I can do or they want it longer than I could do mm-hmm. or whatever, feeling insecure before we even get going that they're going to want more than I can actually deliver. And that creating anxiety within me And then me having my backup plan and my backup plan to my backup plan. Like, okay, well, if I, if I can't, if I come too fast, all right, I'm just gonna start using my fingers and then I'm gonna try to, you know, I'm gonna go to the bathroom and try to like tug on myself and (laughs) maybe I'll breathe beforehand and, oh, maybe if I masturbate before we start engaging, then Mm -hmm. okay, now I can last longer. And, and seriously coming up with a strategy. Like strategizing yeah. about how to be able to last longer, to keep up with this person. And the whole time I'm in my head, the whole yeah. time I'm in my head, because every, every tactic that I come up with is coming from a place of fear, you know? And so that, yeah. that, that's been a big one and a recurring one for me. Mm. Yeah. Oh my gosh. That one's so real. Um, another one of mine this kind of goes into like there's a lot of yeah a lot of appearance stuff on this list of like the appearance of my body and um (laughs) like oh does my stomach look weird in a certain position and like and you're (laughs) it's like there's so much to be aware of in sex of like the feeling and what your body looks like and like yeah bodies look weird in certain positions they just do and like we're not used to being in a lot of those positions um, just in our day-to-day life. So you always, like, there can be concerns coming up of, like, if my stomach looks weird in some position or um, if, <laughs> if like, my butt looks too flat in another position. Like, I don't have a big butt. I, like, I have a small butt. I always have. And I'm always concerned of, like, what if, what if when he sees my ass, like, without clothes on, because maybe, like, my butt looks different in jeans than it does, like, when there's nothing there. And, like, what if he doesn't like it and all of this stuff. Um, and those are things I think that I can definitely, because I struggled with body image really deeply for many years. And now those are things that I can sort of 
look at and laugh at and not care about. Um, but yeah, it's, you know, again, the fear, it comes up, it, it visits. Totally, totally. And those physical <laughs> ones, you know, I, I've experienced physical ones as well, like little things like, mm-hmm. oh, my elbows are too bony or, you know, just yeah. stuff. And you're like, man, but you know, those, th- for me, those things absolutely translate outside of the bedroom. So those same sort mm-hmm. of physical insecurities that, you know, when I'm stripped down and I'm totally naked and you can see everything. Well, yes. I, I had felt them outside of the bedroom as well, just maybe not to such an exposed extent. Um, all right. So let's see another one for me, super insecure to masturbate in front of my partner. That was, huh. yeah, that was very like, I, I remember the first time that conversation got brought up or the first time I did it or whatever, talked about it, like feeling very awkward and, and just like, no, I don't want them to see this thing that I'm so comfortable doing in my secrecy. I don't want you to see mm. that. I don't want you to see my face. I don't want you to see, you know, like the stroke that I use on myself to, to help myself get mm. off. Like, I don't want you to see that and feeling very, very insecure about that idea for, for many years. And, and I don't think I actually ever did that until being married. And um, so that's, that's how deep that insecurity ran. Well, that's so interesting. I wonder if that, I'm, I mean, that's something I actually haven't talked about, like with other people, like if something is like done with a partner, but it's not something I've like talked about with other people. I, I wonder if that's something that women are maybe more comfortable with, if that's the case, I'm not sure, because I've felt comfortable with that. But I wonder if women in general are more comfortable with it because it's something that's like, oh, this is like, this is sexy and men like this. And whereas like women don't say that about men in general, I think. Um, and yeah, oh, that's really, really interesting. I've never, I've never heard that. I wonder if that's like a common thing with men. I mean, I would imagine it is. And yeah, I wonder if a lot of that stems from just like, that's not something like, that's not something you see in porn, you know, yeah. but women touching themselves for sure all the time. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. I, I guess I'm thinking now what, what comes to mind when I associate women masturbating and men masturbating, like when women, mm-hmm. when I think of women masturbating, it's sexy it's feminine. It's, you know, mm-hmm. it's, it's a beautiful thing that you want to watch. Yeah. When I think of men masturbating, like the stories that go through my mind, the context is that it's either it, it's, it's dirty, you know, it's right. You're, you're jerking off. Like literally the, the phrasing for it is, is not, yes. it's not pleasant. Um, and you're, you're doing it, like, you know, for me, so, so many years of just doing it in secrecy. And then it's totally. joked about, like in, in guy groups, it's like, you know, it's, mm-hmm. it's just joked about. Like, oh, I'm going to go, you know, jerk off or, or you know, what, whatever the, 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 the phrases are that, that we use. So <clears throat> mm-hmm. I imagine for me, some of that context around it is what, you know, helped to bring out those insecurities when the conversation of, masturbating in front of my partner was brought up like wait a minute no it's dirty it's weird it's it's something Mm. to laugh at it's not something that you would want to watch and you know creating all of that that fear within me Mm. yeah yeah so real cool let's do um let's do two more each all right um let me see here i am i have an insecurity about um, I think about just like one, uh, we've kind of covered this, but just like wanting it too slow and that, yeah, that men, however I want it, it's just different than he wants it and, and not being able to, um, to communicate that directly without being terrified of turning him off. And like you said, like if the session would be over, if I were to say something. Yeah. Yeah. I get that. I totally do. Yeah. <laughs> All right. For me, asking for sex. I've been super insecure in my Ooh. relationships, asking for sex or initiating sex, like putting out there to my partner in whatever way that I'm turned on and that I, I want to get physical. That has been mm. a big area for me and continues to be a big area for me for some, for some shift to happen. And, um, mm. you know, I think back to, to stories in my own head that I picked up that, you know, my, maybe my partner was, we were having sex, but she didn't want to be having sex with me. 
that she was doing yeah. it out of obligation because it had been a while or because it's Valentine's Day or because, you know, she's my girlfriend mm. and that's what you're supposed to do, quote unquote. So mm. somewhere I picked up this thing that, okay, I won't ask. I, I, I can be certain that she's into it if I just leave the initiating up to her. And that's mm. that's been something my wife and I have talked about, you know, she's like, I feel like I'm always the one who initiates. Mm. And, and I realized that that's, it goes back to, you know, those early, early experiences. So being insecure to ask or initiate sex, that's mine. Yes. Yeah. Wow. All right. Last one um, is what you got. All right. Last one. <laughs> I think this one has come up for me really only recently, actually, because as I've been sort of diving more into sexual expression and like deepening my sexual expression. Um, I think one insecurity is that like, is that I can't come without clitoral stimulation. And I know it's a really common thing, but I see that there's definitely a part of me that feels like as I've been deepening my sexual practice, that I should be able to like have orgasms by like being looked at or you know whatever some kind of insane thing and um <laughs> yeah. because it's like because i have heard of that like i've heard those stories of women like having an orgasm from like a breeze coming on them or something just like feeling wind and like suddenly they're like in this orgasmic state and i'm like well that's never happened to me like is that is that bad am i not spiritual enough it's like that spiritual um uh like that higher spiritual morality coming in of being like if you were really spiritual and you would be able to have orgasms Hmm. by just like being looked at by a really sexy man and like you should be able to just access that state no matter what um so i think there's like that's where some of that insecurity is coming in um yeah and a feeling like i should be able to have an orgasm in any kind of sexual experience no matter what um which yeah is pretty silly (laughs) wow yeah, those shoulds, you know, it's like all the shoulds that we, shoulds we put on ourselves. I should do this. I should be able to do that. And then particularly, like you said, mm-hmm. for you, because you've been doing this work and this, you know, the spiritual work, this, the self work, this, you know, loving on yourself in all those ways, that it's like, well, I should be able to do this because I've done all this spiritual stuff. So why mm-hmm. am I not able to get off when, you know, somebody whispers the right words in my ear or whatever? And totally. Uh, yeah, yeah. I get it. All right, last one for me. Um, for many years, especially when I was younger, I struggled with my, the size of my penis. Super insecure yeah. about that um, because, man, gosh, little Matthew, don't watch porn. Because <laughs> when I'm watching porn, like everybody has got ten inch dicks, and that's you know, like that wasn't me, and so I was insecure about that, and, and insecure that because of my size, because of whatever. I wasn't going to be able to to perform and live up to some expectation. And mm-hmm. so um, getting naked, you know, and it, this is something I, I didn't realize until years later into my late 20s that I didn't want to be naked in front of a new partner unless I was hard. Because mm. then you're seeing like just me, right? But no, no, I want you to see right. me. I want you to see me at least like at my full my full power is what I'm saying and telling myself right. in my head. So the size of my penis was definitely an insecurity and there was all sorts of stuff wrapped up in all of that conversation. So, wow, uh, Kyla, we yeah. went through a lot. <laughs> there was a lot there. Oh my God. <laughs> That's awesome. Man. Yeah, no, this was, um, yeah, that was super, again, these are things that like, I just haven't talked about with, obviously so many people but like even with partners it's like it's that's a weird thing like why are we afraid to say this stuff if we're all thinking the same thing totally totally and that's that's one of the big things that you know i think you said it earlier is that we are thinking these same same things like you aren't the only one challenged and i'm speaking to you listener you right now like you aren't the only one who has these insecurities and and it's okay like, it's okay to have these things. And, you know, I think, mm-hmm. Kyla, what you and I have just have demonstrated is that we just aren't talking about them. So it's so easy to think you're right. the only one to think this stuff when you aren't having conversations with with people about it. And um, mm-hmm. I'd love to leave 
folks with some takeaways on how they can shift those insecurities? Because we just did a great job of, of laying out all sorts of them. <laughs> but, you know, for, for the person who's like, great, I have about 99% of what you guys said. <laughs> how, do, how do we shift them? Um, do you have any feedback yeah. and advice on that? Mm, yes. I think um, a really big one that's been really powerful for me, and, and so much of this I did when I was, again, really challenged with body image and overcoming that, was just spending more time naked. And, um, you know, that can be alone or with your partner or with whoever you want. But I would, when I was dealing with um, overcoming a lot of my body image challenges, I would just, when I would get out of the shower, I would intentionally spend more time naked before I got dressed. And it just allowed me to like get used to the appearance of my own body because I spent so much time avoiding looking at my stomach or at my thighs or, or critiquing instead of just like being in my body. Um, and I think that if, in terms of sexually, this becomes really helpful in terms of like, yeah, oh, this is this is what my pussy looks like. This is what my butt looks like. This is what my breasts look like. Um, and not it ha- not having it be about the judgment of it or uh, the fear of what it looks like and, and just being really comfortable with like, this is my body and there don't be all these stories around it. I think is really powerful. Absolutely. I think that's huge. And um, I, I, I've, I've experienced the, mm, the dissolving of a lot of my fears and insecurities about my physical appearance from doing mm-hmm. what you said, just more time being naked, more time looking at yourself, affirming yourself, you know, your nude self. Mm -hmm. And it can feel super weird. Like, if you're not used to doing that, it feels awkward as hell to stand in front of a mirror and to admire yourself. Um, But (laughs) but what you're doing is you're just making subtle, like, re-scripting, you know, because so often, like, our shirt comes off, and I, I think we would be totally floored if, for example, if we could see the words, the judgments, the things that mm. are flying through our heads at an insanely fast speed automatically, if we could see those things like written on a wall when we take our clothes off, we'd probably be, be floored mm-hmm. by how negative and, and damaging those comments are. So doing what you just suggested, spending more time naked looking at yourself in the mirror is a great, simple way to begin shifting a relationship to our naked body to begin shifting the conversation we have about our naked body. And, you know, that's mm-hmm. how, that's how you, you can, you can get through some of this stuff for sure. Yes. Oh, so beautiful. Yeah. And I'll, I'll share. So I, um, I got, I got in a real big kick the past few years of just taking bold action. Like, all right, I'm feeling this fear. What's the massive action I could take to dissolve this fear. And so mm-hmm. um, I had been, I was in a, a, a life, accountability group, a life mastermind group with six other people. So there's seven of us. And we were just talking about different things and talking about fears and things that are coming up, blockages. And a person in the group put out there, what if we did a nude meeting? What if we did one of our weekly meetings completely in the nude? And Kyla, that idea terrified me. It oh ter- ter- terrified, terrified, no confronting, right? right. And I, I had never experienced anything like that. So, you know, I didn't say yes or no. I just really went and, and sat with my fears for a while. And I decided, okay, I'm feeling this massive anxiety. I know that there's some healing to be done by going through this experience, but I really need to, to build up my courage. So I came up with a plan to go and get a physical because I said, I thought to myself, if I get this physical, then the, uh, the doctor will have to see me naked and, you know, oh. and, and I'll get touched and poked and prodded. So it'll help me feel better about myself. And then I said, yeah. also, I need to go to a nude spa. If I go to a naked spa, like, then I get a chance to get some reps in. Um, I didn't end up getting the physical, but I did end up going to the spa. And I do remember that mm-hmm. moment when I dropped my pants and walked out into the, into the main area with all the other naked men, and this is the first time I've ever been naked in front of people, and it wow. wasn't that bad, you know. Like yeah. people weren't measuring dick sizes, and there were like everybody wasn't staring at me, and you know it was mm-hmm. just it was okay. So then 
the next week rolls around and we have our nude meeting and I was still nervous, but it was okay. And so mm. I'm not recommending necessarily for you listening who's got anxieties about your body that you ask six of your friends to come over and you guys play naked Scrabble or something. But, you know, if you did have insecurities like me with your body, like there are things you could do, right? You know, you could do mm-hmm. different things to just feel more comfortable in your skin. And that's really what it is. Like yeah. figure out what what you can do to help create a little bit more comfort in your skin. And um, hey, if you're open to exploring the spa idea, I, I went to one in, in here in Atlanta and uh, I didn't really know those things existed, but it was very healing for me. It's very healing for me to be in that environment and be naked and for it to be okay. So that was something that I did personally. Mm. Yes. Yeah. I actually probably a year ago also went to like a, a Japanese bathhouse for the first time. Yep. And also, yeah, a room full of naked women. And I had no intention of going there naked. I was going to wear a bathing suit, but the friend that I was with, she like took off all her clothes and I was like, Oh, are, are you going to, you're going to go naked? She's like, yeah, for sure. I'm like, of course I am. And so I did too. And again, it was the same thing. Like no one's paying attention to you and everyone is just there being in their body and just relaxing. And it was really also, yeah, such a healing experience to just be a woman being in my body, not worrying about and freaking out about what my skin looks like. And if this is as big or as small as it should be. And um, just being with people who are being people. Yes. And what's cool about that is you get to see there are so many different types of bodies. Like so many bodies. It, everyone's <laughs> different and it's all great. It's all it's all beautiful. It's all so, great. Yeah. Mm. So that that's cool that you had a, a similar experience. Um All right, what else do you have in terms of how to shift some insecurities? Oh, um mm, I would say I mean, I think just like opening up these conversations, yes, with your partner, if you have one, um, but I think just especially like in peer groups of like with your friends and just being more willing to to open up the conversation around sex and um, again, just seeing it as this thing that like we all deal with and we're all doing and it's... um. And and being really open to it being like a little uncomfortable and a little weird and, and it's okay and we can laugh about it and uh, we can laugh at our insecurities and recognize that they're all there. And um, yeah, slowly, slowly. And I think people, and this is definitely my experience, people would be surprised at like how kind of fun and easy those conversations can be when people opt into them um, instead of them being like horribly awkward, they're kind of funny awkward. Um, yeah. And yeah, just again, it's like we're all we're all having this experience, and like let's laugh about how funny it is that we all feel insecure about it. Yeah, I totally agree. I think when you get into those conversations, although they might be awkward, you realize that it's kind of fun talking about this stuff that has felt so taboo, and that you know mm-hmm. it, it, it becomes really exciting to realize that wow, they're having these same thoughts and feelings that I am. Like, holy crap, I'm not alone. Like there's, there's a lot of, Mm -hmm. um, it it feels great for that. So I love what you said about communicating and getting in peer groups. Um, I think for me, one of the, one of the first things is to, you know, shifting those insecurities is just being okay. Like you said, talking about them, um, but really just acknowledging them, you know, because I I just denied so many things. I I denied them. Um, I, I, I guess I recognized they were insecurities, but I didn't think there was anything I could do about them. So, um, you know, really, like, for me, nothing helped to build my fear more than trying to suppress my fear, mm-hmm. you know? And so talking about them or just writing things down, like, I journaled for a little while because I was so private. I was so secretive, even with my, my relationships. I didn't want to actually talk about things, so I journaled. But just getting those ideas out, because it's, sometimes when you write some of those things down, like, you sort of, you can read them and recognize, wow, it's not that big of a deal or it's kind of silly. Yeah. That's kind of how I felt making my list before we jumped on the phone today. So communicating mm. really is, is, uh, is one of the, is, is, is super important. And then if you do have a partner, you know, communicating these things with your partner, like maybe sit mm-hmm. down and, and do what we did and just, Hey, here are my list of insecurities. What are your list of insecurities? Let's talk about them. Yeah. You know, like there's a lot of, 
there's a lot of uh, understanding. It's like, wow, okay, I didn't know you felt that way about this. Great. Now I'm armed with that information and I can do something about it next time that we're in, you know, an intimate setting. Mm-hmm. Oh, yes. And, yeah, I love that. Yeah. And, and you said this earlier when we were talking about communicating. You said uh, do it in a non sexual context. I think that's yes. huge. So, like, like this type of conversation, this is a very non sexual context, right? And mm-hmm. because sometimes we only, I know for me, I only wanted to talk about this stuff or I felt like, I was only in the space to talk about it right before or after sex. And then yeah. who wants to talk about insecurities like while you're in the <laughs> act? So I'm glad you said that earlier to, you know, as you're communicating or when you're communicating, create a space that's, that doesn't have any sort of sexual pressure. So you can, just, mm-hmm. you can just talk, you know, go out to lunch and talk about it. I mean, totally remove any of, of that pressure and, and create a totally non-sexual context. And you might find that these conversations can flow a little bit more freely. Yeah, yeah, I love that. So important, like you said, removing the pressure and yeah. just, just talking about it. it's just a part of life. Yeah. All right, any other, mm-hmm. any other uh, insights that you can give to help people shift Ooh. insecurities? I think, um, like you said, you know, looking these things in the eye, acknowledging them and, and seeing, being really honest about how this translates to the rest of your life and how he said, you know, so much of this stuff is not just about sex and the appearance, being concerned about the appearance of your body or what your face looks like or uh, showing up as your fullest, most expressive sexual self. If you're afraid of doing those things, that has a lot more to do with how you're showing up in places outside of the bedroom. and um, yeah, and taking a really solid inventory of that and working, and it, that's another thing, is like these things can be worked on outside of the bedroom. And um, so much of, you know, if you're concerned about what your pussy looks like, that's a deeper message of like how you are possibly afraid of showing up as, as a woman and what, is, what does it mean for you and how do you think women are supposed to show up and look and behave um, and to really take those things. And when you see how they transform in every other area of your life, they, the transformations in the bedroom will happen naturally. Totally. Totally. It's like the bedroom magnifies those fears, those Mm -hmm. insecurities, those self-worth conversations, all of that stuff, it gets magnified in the bedroom. So if you're experiencing it in the bedroom, chances are that it's something that you, you know, can explore and heal and it's going to impact all the other areas of your life. Yeah, beautifully said. Mm. All right, cool. So I have two last things that were really, like, when I thought about, okay, what is sort of the the theme of a lot of my insecurities, a lot of mine had to do with performance. And so mm-hmm. when I think about the performance stuff for me, so much of that had to do with anxiety, fears, nervousness, all of that stuff. And mm-hmm. that was very symbolic of me being in my head. When I'm in my head Mm -hmm. and I'm thinking, well, then I can create all of these scenarios that make me feel nervous and scared and all of that. So, you know, I Mm -hmm. jotted down a couple of things. And and if you're out there listening and you're like me and those, you you feel like you're in your head a lot. One, one of the first things that has helped me is just to take things slowly, you know, Mm -hmm. you like building up, setting the space, you know, that foreplay can come in and just creating that that environment and you, know, you don't have mm-hmm. to jump in at a hundred miles an hour right from the get go. Right. So mm-hmm. building things up um, and then, you know, pause if you need it. Like for yeah. me, sometimes I would feel that, that urge to, you know, to come and I didn't want to at that moment, but I didn't feel like I was able to pause. So it's like, give yourself mm-hmm. permission to like pause when we need it. If I need to stop stroking, cool, I can stop stroking and do something else. I can go down on my partner, Mm -hmm. you know, whatever it Mm -hmm. is. And then really focusing on them and not focusing on myself because I recognize that when I'm caught up about whether or not I'm going to orgasm and all of that, it's because I'm focusing on me and I'm not paying, I'm not paying close enough attention to her. And I found as I've gained a little bit more mastery around myself, um, especially in the sexual arena that when I do just focus on my partner, right? Like my body calms down, you know, when mm-hmm. I'm, when I'm focused on connecting to, to her movements and her, her body mm-hmm. undulations and her noises, when I'm just trying to connect with that, 
I'm mm-hmm. out of my head, I'm in my heart, and man, things really become explosive and uh you know, no pun intended, but that's <laughs> that's been very, very helpful to me as it relates to performance issues. Mm. That's beautiful. Yeah, I love that it's so much. It's like we forget, it's like so much of sex is about giving and about connection and how beautiful that is to like pay, be paying deep, undivided attention to your partner and, and yeah, how that just creates such a different experience. It's so much more present, so much less in our heads, so much more in our body. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, if you're listening and the next time you find yourself in a, in a sexual experience and you're feeling nervous and anxious, you know, recognize that that's, that's, that's you in your head and that's okay. Mm -hmm. And so just take that signal from your body, those nerves, and just pour that energy into your partner and see what happens. Mm -hmm. Just try something, but, but focus the attention on them and see if your body starts to calm down because that's happened for me nine times out of 10 when I'm feeling, you know, and anxious, anxiousness that comes from a sense of fear, right? Because sometimes you're just sort of like excitedly buzzing and there might be a little nerves, but they are not rooted in fear. When they're rooted in right. fear, I have found that diverting my attention and energy from myself into my partner and pouring it into them has helped to get mm-hmm. my body back into that powerful space. So that's um, just a little, little takeaway. Beautiful. Love that. Kylie, you're awesome. This has been a lot of fun. This has been this has been uh, a little nerve wracking at times, but man, just yes. a powerful conversation. How do you feel? Uh, I feel good. It's funny. I'm like having. I know a lot of people that know me personally are going to listen to this episode, and there's the part of me that's pretty terrified of that, and then another, another part of me that, again, is going back to what we've been saying of like we're all doing this, and we all feel the same way, and there's really nothing to be concerned about. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it'll be it'll be cool to hear the feedback you get from, you know, your your circles and same with me as I share this with people and you know, for me like there's this element of having this type of conversation with somebody who is not my wife, which is mm-hmm. like an interesting like oh, okay. All right. You know, like there there's something around mm-hmm. that. Um and I think that's just for me it's along this idea of just normalizing these types of conversations. That, you know, they don't have to be had in secret. Um, They don't necessarily have to be even had with with the person who I, you know, go to sleep with every night. That we Mm -hmm. can talk about these things because there's learning to be done by me hearing your experience and by me hearing your insecurities Mm -hmm. and vice versa. So I'm very grateful to you um, for opening up. Yeah, same here. You you brought it. You brought it. And you made me have to step up (laughs) my, my insecurity sharing game because... You really brought it today, and that's that's huge. So that's that's so awesome. So thank you. Mm, thank you so much. Yeah, I, uh, yeah. Like you said, I think yeah, having a conversation with someone who isn't your partner, it's, it's great, and it's also just again, like you said, putting it in the context of like, oh, you have sex, I have sex too, and like we can talk about this, and it doesn't have to be about one another. It's just our experiences, and um, yeah, it's such a powerful thing. I hope we've opened up for a lot of the listeners here of uh, just the permission to talk about these things and to be open with them and to let it be kind of weird and to laugh about it. Yeah, absolutely. Just creating an environment of being more comfortable talking about things that are uncomfortable. Yes, 100%. Quick note about the Having It All podcast. I am not a doctor nor a licensed therapist. I'm a guy with a story and a passion for conscious conversation. My thoughts, opinions, and beliefs are my own. So please consult with your doctor or healthcare provider regarding any questions or issues you have related to your personal, physical, or mental health. Hello, it is Ryan, and we could all use an extra bright spot in our day, couldn't we? Just to make up for things like sitting in traffic, doing the dishes, counting your steps, you know, all the mundane stuff. That is why I'm such a big fan of Chumba Casino. Chumba Casino has all your favorite social casino style games that you can play for free anytime, anywhere with daily bonuses. That should brighten your day a little. Actually, a lot. So sign up now at ChumbaCasino.com. That's ChumbaCasino.com. No purchase necessary. BGW. Void. We're prohibited by law. See terms and conditions. 18 plus.